today, the assurance of our salvation is part five, which is purifying hope that perseveres. Purifying hope that perseveres. And we will be looking at 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 through chapter 3, verse 9. Verse 28 of 1 John 2 says, Now, little children, abide in him, meaning persevere in Christ, endure to the end, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming, as will those without hope and the life of God. Now, at first glance, it would seem here that he's saying that as a child of God, you may shrink away from him in shame. But that is not what he's saying. And we're going to see this as we go forward, that the perseverance of the saints is part of the new covenant. Sometimes all of us have wondered whether or not we're saved. Has anyone thought that, you know, am I, is this for real? Am I really a child of God? And why do we ask those questions? Because we know how imperfect and how inconsistent we are. Our sometimes tendencies to stray away and not do exactly what God says will affect our assurance, but it in no way affects the security of your salvation. And the church can say, Amen. Amen. Jesus clearly stated that only those who persevere and endure to the end will be saved. And we see that in Matthew 24, verses 11 through 13. Jesus said, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Isn't that 2023? Verse 13, but the one who endures or perseveres to the end, he will be saved. Now, does this mean there is a possibility that someone God saves or anyone God saves, has saved by his sovereign choice and power may not endure to the end? No. I remember growing up, people would say, well, you can't say that you're saved. Uh, 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 Ellen White, the prophet of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which I came out of, she said, you shouldn't teach people that you're saved. And the reasoning was, she said, well, Peter, he fell to temptation. So in other words, her th reasoning was that Peter was not saved because he betrayed Jesus. No, Peter was saved because he, before he betray betrayed Jesus, Jesus told him, you are already clean. Jesus told him, Peter, you're saved. And because you're saved, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Did he fall into temptation? Yes. Did his faith fail? No. Why? Because he did not ultimately leave the God he loved. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he finally said, Lord, you know all things. And Jesus said, go feed my sheep. And you and I sometimes are just like Peter. We will do things that betray our God and Savior by our behavior. But you're not saved because of your behavior. You're saved because of the goodness of the Savior. And he promised to keep you. He promised never to leave you. And he promised that he will come back to get you. Why? Because you are his own. The McCarthy study Bible commentary says this on Matthew 24, verse 13. This does not suggest that our perseverance secures our salvation. Scripture everywhere teaches precisely the opposite. God, as part of his saving work, secures our perseverance. Did you know that? I didn't know that for years. I thought it was up to me. I had to persevere to the end because you said only those that endure to the end will be saved. But religion will never teach you that it is God who ensures your perseverance. And therefore, the just live by faith and we live by faith in what? The finished work of Christ that he will do everything he promised. He said those he justifies, he will glorify. Why? Because he chose you before the foundation of the world. God will not change his mind about one, not one of his children. He will never change his mind. Verse 29 of 1 John 2 says, if you know that he is righteous, 
you know that everyone also who practices or perseveres in righteousness is born of him, meaning born of God. Well, how were they born of God? John 1 13 says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God told Noah, I'm saving you. Did he save him? All those he calls, he justifies. Jesus said, all that the father give to me, I will raise them up in the last day. You see, our blessed assurance first comes in the promise of God. And because we believe the promise of God, our lives reflect that belief in the promise. We persevere because God has caused us to persevere. Now, you will all agree that God's love is unfailing and unchanging, right? Then I don't understand why so many Christians suffer from spiritual paranoia. You ever meet them? They have spiritual paranoia, believing that God would allow them to lose their salvation if their actions do not meet his perfect expectations. That's religion. Any teaching that says your salvation is dependent upon your behavior is not the gospel. Your good works reflect what God has already done. Ephesians 2, you were saved by grace through faith. Therefore, we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in him to do the good work. Therefore, the reason why you love God, the reason why you read the Bible, the reason why you pray, the reason why you hate the sin you see all around you is not because of you. It is because God is working in you and what's in you comes out of you and that does two things it glorifies God and it gives you assurance of your salvation just spiritual paranoids schizophrenics he loves me who oh, had a bad thought he loves me not I prayed today he loves me well I shouldn't have said that he loves me not you ever gone through that when you're under religion you will go through that. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, see how great, how, let's get this, let's soak in this for a minute. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God and such we are. For this reason, the world which is separated from the life of God, according to Ephesians 4.18, does not know or understand us because it did not know or understand him. The darkness could not comprehend. The darkness could not understand Jesus. There was Jesus standing, get this, he's standing before the scribes and Pharisees and says to a man on a mat, take up your bed and walk. He goes and spits in the ground, puts mud on their eye, and he, he gains his sight. And these fools have the audacity to say, who do you think you are? They couldn't see salvation standing in front of them. Why? Because they were in darkness and darkness and self-righteousness worked together. They were self-righteous. They were dependent upon their works. One commentator says the real aliens, you know, people are looking for aliens, extraterrestrial beings. Well, the real aliens in the world are not extraterrestrials, but Christians. We are peculiar people. As new creations, Christians, we, the children of God, display a godly nature and lifestyle that is foreign to unbelievers. They even are surprised that we do not join them in their reckless and wild living. Isn't that right? Well, you know, it ain't going to Man, you, just, you don't have to do all that. You don't call for all that. Well, you know, and it's like, man, you, you, you can just slide this one time. No, you can't. Once you get on a slide, you keep on what? Sliding. Amen. Verse 2 of 1 John 3. Beloved. Beloved. What's that word? Next word? Now. Mm -hmm. now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. 
We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And here it is from Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew mean he loved in advance, not those he knew would love him first. No, that is a lie from the pit of hell. God, we don't love God first and then he chooses to love us. He loved us before we existed. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So when, he's, when we see him, we will see him just as he is. Why? Because sin cannot stand in the presence of God. No sin can exist or continue to exist in the presence of God. This is the principle of now, but not yet. Now, we are the children of, of God. But we are not yet what we will be. This is why you continue to stumble and fall as you walk on the path of righteousness. Because you are a child of God, but you're not yet what you're going to be. Our love for God and others is consistently inconsistent because we have not yet been perfected. Can anybody say yes? You sh or like some church say, show you right. You sure right. This is, you see, religion says that you should be able to get rid of all sin. That there should be, you shouldn't even, people say, I don't even have any bad thoughts anymore. That was one right there because you lied. We will see him in the pure light of his glory because he will give us new sinless bodies that match the work he has already completed in our souls. You're not perfect yet. And God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He expects you to pursue perfection. Two different things. Two different things. We are in the pursuit of perfection, but we have not yet been perfected. But we will be perfected when we see him. This is our hope or our confident expectation. Isn't that your expectation that you're going to see Jesus? I know it is. I say it over and over again. You sing a song about heaven. You sing like you're already there. You sing it when we all get to heaven. And I can't even finish the rhythm. Y'all just join in. What a day of because your hope is in what God has promised. Verse 3, 1 John 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself or perseveres in righteousness just as he is pure. We do what God has already done. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As Jesus endured by focusing on the joy set before him, we too endure because of the joy God has placed in our hearts. What is the joy that he sets before us? First, you have to understand what the joy of the Lord is. We say the joy of the Lord is our strength. And everybody go, amen. The joy of the Lord. If you ask them, what is the joy of the Lord? You have five or six different answers. The scripture tells us what the joy of the Lord is. The joy of the Lord is to save his own. That's his joy. Wasn't the, the, the prodigal father, did he have joy when his son came back? Didn't the, the shepherd who went out to seek the lost sheep, wasn't there joy? The joy of the Lord is to save his own. And because we too have that, we have that joy in us, knowing he saves us, it causes us to be able to what? To know that our faith is being and will be perfected by him. And that joy set before us causes us to endure the cross that we are all called to bear. We despise the shame and one day we will stand before Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God the Father. The MacArthur Study Bible commentary says this about perseverance. The guarantee of our perseverance is built into the new covenant promise. God says, I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. 
That's in Jeremiah 32, 40. Didn't the, the new covenant, see, we, we forget the new covenant. Every time we have communion, we quote what Jesus said. This is the blood of the new covenant, right? Okay, the new covenant guarantees that all God saved, all those God saved will remain saved. Because he said, I'll give you a new spirit, new desires. I will give you a, a, a heart to serve me. And then part of it, it says, I will put the fear of me in you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Isn't that right? So God, you know, it's just like a father. I remember that there was this fear. Love, lovely man, lovely. And he was just, he was just so nice and kind. But oh, when he, when, when you saw that burrow for, you know, you did something and his face contorted a little bit and he started reaching for that buckle. <laughs> Talking about the fear of the Lord. <laughs> and not only while you were going through it, when you were in the middle of doing something wrong, you're like, oh man. Or it would also prevent you from doing what you shouldn't do. Isn't that right? The reason why there's so much foolishness today, there's no fear. These kids today don't have any fear. They don't fear anybody. They go around running down the street shooting at cops. What kind of nonsense is that? Why? Because the foolish have already told them they're not going to get arrested. It's okay. You can shoplift. You can, as long as it's not over a certain amount, we'll let you get away with it. What kind of nonsense is that? To say that God secures our perseverance is not to say that we are passive in the process, however. There's God's, now in, 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 there's always God's part in our part. But the reason why we do our part is because of God's part. You see that? All right. So God gives us the privilege of being his own. And then we have the responsibility to do it. But you can't do what you're responsible for unless you first remember that he's given you everything to do it. Because we are the children of God, we have an obligation to walk as children of light so that men will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. To put on display to the glory of God the work that he has graciously and miraculously done in us. The question is, how do, what is our responsibility? What are some of the things that we are supposed to do? We're going to look at Ephesians 4. Verses 17 through 24, Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, meaning unbelievers or pagans, in the futility of their mind. Verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, meaning incapable of, a com of comprehending the light. John 1, 5, they can't comprehend it. They are, why? Because they are excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. There's a pastor that goes around reading a book in the library at schools. And in this book are very explicit descriptions of intimate relationship. And he began to read the book to the school board. And the school board president, oh, Pastor, pa, 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 wait, wait a minute, Pastor, pa, pa. he didn't want him to read it. And so he said, wait a minute, you don't want to hear this, then why should the children be able to read it in school? You see, why? You, you have to understand the reason why I heard a pastor, a big church in Nashville. He said this. He said, you know, it's time for the church to rise. It's time for us to take back society. It's time for us to not be silent on these things. I'm tired of hearing another Bible study on Romans 9. We need to be out there affecting the society. Let me tell you something. I don't care how big your church is. When you don't understand the word of God, you say dumb things like that. Jesus said in the last days, it's going to get worse. Did he, did he not say that? 
And the reason why he said they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Jesus Christ didn't go around trying to change society. The prophet, the apostles didn't go around trying to change society. They went out and preached the gospel. And by the preaching of the gospel, faith came by hearing. Hearing came by the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not here to make society better because it's going to hell in a handbasket. But all those God says will be going up with him. Amen. Amen. This is nonsense. You think you do we really think the reason why the world is the way it is today because the church hasn't done its job? Huh? No, no. That's why you don't have to go killing yourself trying to save everybody that don't want to be saved. Amen. Amen. There are people who will go around handing out tracts. They'll go out, they're ministering to everybody but their own family. And the children wind up hating the parents and hating the church. Why? Because they put so much effort out there and didn't pour into the ones right in front of them. Oh, I know it's true. The children of light who possess and are possessed by the light of the world, Jesus Christ, have the mind of Christ and pursue righteousness, which is wisdom. The world walks in darkness and continually pursues unrighteousness, which is foolishness. That's what they're going to do. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Good news. I, I got good news for you. Things are going to get worse. Why? Because the baby's coming. Cramping a little bit. The whole world is mourning, waiting for, mourning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. When, when a mother has that child, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. A lot of pain. Uh, and, and, ooh, ooh, ooh. and then the water breaks. And then it really gets bad, doesn't it? Why? Because the baby's coming. The Jesus Christ who came as a baby the first time is not coming in a manger. He's coming on a white horse and he's taking no names. I tell you, he's going to come and he's going to straighten this whole thing out. Amen. Verse 19, Ephesians 4. And they, talking about the world, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with Greediness. Not only do they want to walk in impurity, they can't get enough of it. They find new ways, new definitions. And if you don't agree with they, them, sis, whatever. I thought a sis was something full of pus you get on your sis. Anyway, cisgender. I had no sis, sister, whatever it is. I make man made in the image of God. My feminine side is in my wife, and I don't need to be like her. I'm not called to be a woman. Amen. Amen. Verse 20, Ephesians 4. But you, children of light, did not learn Christ in this way. In what way? That living as the Gentiles do is acceptable to God. Verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. What? Have we heard and what have we been taught about Jesus Christ? That if any man or woman is in Christ, he or she is a new creature that does what God has already done. He died for our sins. By this gospel, you are saved. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to scripture. He was buried and he rose on the third day according to scripture. For what purpose? To save us from our sin. S I N. He didn't come to save us from our mistakes. Let's get let's just call it what it is. When we sin, it's not a mistake. It is a conscious decision to operate in lawlessness. That's what it is. That's what sin is. We know what's right, but we choose not to do it. I knew what mom and dad said, but there were times I would choose not to do it. And they would lower the kindness of their love upon me in whatever manner they saw fit. <laughs> Verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, this is what we learn. 
you lay aside the old self or put to death the deeds of the body, Romans 8, 13, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit or the thoughts, understanding and beliefs of your mind. This is what we have been taught in Jesus Christ, that we put off the old, we put the, we put to death the old deeds. Our old self was crucified with Christ. Our old self was crucified with Christ in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, thus giving us hope and a guaranteed future with him. Working out. This is what God has done. He's already crucified. We've been crucified with him. Working out our own salvation with fear and trembling is our responsibility. Verse 24. And put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness, meaning purity of the truth. This is, you have been washed with the pure word of God. God has already cleansed you from all of your sin. Get this. It doesn't matter how bad it was. He has cleansed every one of his children from their sin. Yours and mine. If only we could remember that. That is good news. Good news is not that we have the opportunity for our sins to be forgiven. Good news is that they have been forgiven. Now let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. We pick it up at verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is a mistake. No, it's lawlessness. Verse 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and him and in him there is no sin. Jesus died so you could have your best life. Jesus died so you could have that good car, that you could have the money. No, no, no. He died for sin because covetousness is still sin. I don't care whose name you put on it. Covetousness is still covetousness. Jesus saved you and me so we could proclaim the goodness of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. His intent is that we declare it here on earth. Declare what? His goodness. He doesn't want us proclaiming it from heaven. That's why we're still here. God gets glory when we are put in strenuous circumstances and what's in us comes out of us. When the spirit of God is in you, when you stub your toe, when someone does evil against you, you don't rear back and let them have it. <laughs> or at least we're not supposed to. <laughs> but as we grow in grace and in faith, you find yourself doing it less and less and less. The reason why you have been placed in the hard situations that you've been placed in is so that the spirit of God in you could be made evident to everyone around you. That's how you know you're saved. You see, the prosperity gospel avoids all of that. No, 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 no. God, God doesn't want you sick. God, let me tell you something. When I was sick, that's when God was glorified. He wasn't glorified in my sickness. He was glorified because in the sickness, he was still the center of my hope. Amen. And the same with you. He's the center of your hope. He's the center of your joy. Whether your body falls apart or not, he is glorified in and through you. Verse 6 of 1 John 3. No one who, ab who abides or hopes and perseveres in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. This is the verse of the religious. No one who abides in him sins. That's why I can truly say I don't sin anymore. I have overcome my sin and I thank God I'm not like this little sinner over here. I tithe on everything I get. I am 
I've been faithful. I've been walking in this way for 30 years, and this church couldn't do without me if I, if I were ever to leave. Uh, I'm thankful that I've brought a lot of people to the Lord by my stellar example. <laughs> Nonsense. So we see this text. Now, here's the rub. Here's the rub when you read this. It appears that only those who no longer, no longer sin truly know God. Doesn't it say no one who abides in him sins? No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Oh, what? what? If that were true, all of us would be lost. This is why you never take one verse and make a whole belief system out of it. Context is king. And I want to say this to you. I know that there are daily words and there are things like that. They're good because you're reading the Bible. But I plead, I implore you, just don't read what they want you to focus on. Take a few minutes and to read everything around that verse, would you please? Because that's how they will make you believe something that is not true. Context is king. So when we see this, what does he mean? The answer is in the very next verse, verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who what? Practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Children of God, we practice righteousness. You ever hear the term practice makes perfect? That's not true. Practice doesn't make perfect. There are people who practice all the time. You know, you, you look at people, how many times they practice or, and they bake something and it doesn't turn out right. Or they practice, uh, you know, they practice football and they still, miss, they still miss it. They practice shots. They still miss the shot. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice reveals desire. Practice reveals desire. Whatever you practice is what you desire to master. Okay? It doesn't make you perfect, but it does show your desire to master whatever you're practicing. Verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. In other words, a consistent lifestyle of sin. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, what? To destroy the works of the devil. Where? In us. In us. You see this all the time. He came to destroy the works of the devil. So the assurance of your salvation, when you see your purifying hope, causes you to persevere through life. You find yourself still going forward. Lord, this hurts. I can't stand this. But you keep going forward. You, Lord, not again. You keep moving forward. Lord, this one's really bad. You keep going forward. Father, for the 15th time, I promise not to fail you, but I did it again. And you call Abba, Father, in your desperation. And he hears you and he cleanses you from all your sin and all your unrighteousness. And you keep moving forward. Perfection. Salvation is not perfection. It's direction. Professing Christians who are not only proud of their sin. Now get this, professing Christians who are not only proud of their sin, but want you to celebrate their sin along with them are liars and the truth is not in them. You're going to see some, a particular type of parade this month. And you're going to see some people with collars on, walking with these professing Christians. I'm here to tell you on the authority of the word of God, they are liars, and the truth is not in them. Man, how, Dana, what, you're not supposed to judge. I'm not judging. If a creature came on here with four legs, I go, ar, ar, ar. it's a dog. Right? See, it's not judging. It's spiritual discernment. Because we first recognize the sin in ourselves. We see here, the Bible is telling us plainly, the one who practices sin is of the devil. But no, no, Brother Reed, you can't say that. That's, that's mean. We, we need to be nice to people. How are they ever going to come to God if we're not nice? Don't, don't argue with me. Argue with 1 John 3.8. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9. 
No one who is born of God practices sin. No one. Why? Because his seed. What seed? The living and enduring word of God, according to 1 Peter 1, 23, abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, remember, the key word here is practices. That means an uninterrupted pattern of sin. There is no child of God who lives in an uninterrupted pattern of sin. Not one. Why? Because the seed, the living word of God lives within you. So what does this do? It gives you assurance that you are saved. Why? Because you no longer desire to sin. Your desires have changed. Your pattern of living, the pattern of your life, the trajectory of your life has changed. You, were, Someone told you, if you want salvation, you got to go north to Indianapolis. You got to go north to Indianapolis. But when we were rebels, we turned around and went south, headed towards Mobile, trying to find salvation. When Jesus Christ came and the Holy Spirit came to you, you were facing this way when you repented. Your repentance was based upon faith in believing what God has said. You're no longer headed in the wrong direction. You're now headed straight for Indianapolis. You're going north. Isn't that right? But sometimes along the way, you will bust a tire. Sometimes you may get drowsy on the road and go off the road. But I'm here to tell you, you're no longer on the wrong road. You're on the right road. You're headed toward, you're pressing toward the promise of God in Christ Jesus. You're no longer on hell's road. You're on heaven's road. And God will keep you on that road. This is God's guarantee of perseverance of the saints. It's guaranteed. No one born of God. You're not born of God because you will it. You're not born of God because of your own free will. It is not free will. It is the free will of God that he saves you. So if you're saved by your free will, that means you are making God responsible for your decision. Isn't that right? If, if, if we're saved by our free will, then God is obligated to do what we will. No. Well, Dana, here's the argument. Then that means you're a robot. Hmm. You got here without any input, didn't you? You got here. Your you had no input in your name, your height. The color of your hair, the timbre of your voice, the shape of your ears, nothing about you that is you. You had any input in. So why in the world do we think that God is obligated to go by our will when, when John says we are not born of the will of man, but by the will of God? God is obligated to keep only one promise, his. And because he is love, he has promised to keep you. He has promised to never leave you. And he has promised that you will make it all the way home. Amen. You are assured of this by faith. How, do, how are you secured? You are secured by faith, which is the gift of God. You always believe it. And what you believe, you do. The reason why you have faith is because God gave it to you. He gave it to you so that you would remain faithful in every circumstance. Romans 8, 24 through 25. We'll close on this. Verse 24, Romans 8. Now in this hope, what hope? The redemption of our bodies, we were saved. Saved from what? From the works of the devil. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. First John 1, 15 and 16. That's what he saved you from. Yet hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he sees? What he's saying here is that, wait a minute. This is your confident expectation, but not your present reality. Got it? You're not perfect yet. Now you are a child of God, but you have not yet 
been perfected. So who holds for what he's already said? There's no hope. That's why the scribes and the Pharisees are without hope and without a future separated from the life of God. That's why the world is without hope, without a future and separated from God because they think that they have already arrived. But they haven't. And only by the grace of God will they be able to see that. Verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience, meaning perseverance. Do you see that? Because of the hope that God has put in you, you will persevere. And I love what Romans 5, 5 says. This hope will not disappoint us. Why? Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, who was given to us. Is anybody in this room glad? Is anyone in this room happy this morning? Is anyone here encouraged in Jesus Christ? Encouraged in Christ. In Christ alone, our hope is found. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame. We don't care how good we look or how good we sound or how religious people, how good people think we are. We don't trust in that. But we wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. But I'm here to tell you, you once were sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the seed heard your despairing cry from the waters. He lifted you. Now you can say, now safe? And how long will you be safe? Oh, come on. Yeah. Does, now, doesn't that cause you? Does that not cause you to praise God for who he is? This is the only teaching that gives God the glory. Any other teaching gives the glory to man. You decided to follow Jesus. You did. You. I'm here today to tell you we have decided to follow Jesus because God decided to save us. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord, that even in this service, we saw you answer our prayer. You gave us what we asked for, even with technology. Why? Because it was for your glory. It was for your glory alone. So, Lord, we thank you. May we leave this place encouraged by your word and encouraged by the example of your faithfulness we've seen today. Oh, Lord, we trust not in our ability. We trust in your sovereignty. And we stand firm on your word that has been planted in us. Thank you for your love you've given us. Thank you that now we are your children, but we're not yet what we're going to be. And Lord, because we know we will be like you, we'll be like your son, we will continue to fight to kill the flesh and to put on the new self. In Jesus' name, amen.